Ladies and gentlemen, this is Simarjeet Singh with another episode of the Beginner's Mind series. Let me begin with uh, this little, these lines from Hafiz, who said, I sometimes forget that I was created for joy. Don't we all? I sometimes forget that I was created for joy. My mind is too busy. My heart is too heavy for me to remember that I have been called to dance the sacred dance of life. I was created to smile, to love, to be lifted up and to lift others up. O sac sacred one, untangle my feet from all that ensnares, free my soul, that we might dance and that our dancing might be contagious. O sacred one, untangle my feet from all that ens ensnares, free my soul, that we might dance and that our dancing might be contagious. Hafiz, beautiful lines there. and. Also, a chilling reminder how we get caught up in the things that are not important and in the process we forget to dance the sacred dance. Two things changed my life as far as time management and productivity are concerned. Two sentences, two philosophies, whatever you like to call it. First was from Dr. Stephen Covey who said, uh, if you don't learn to say no to the unimportant, you will never mm. be able to say yes to what's really important inside you. Second was my mentor at the Indian Institute of Management in Lucknow, uh, Dr. Archana Shokla. We happened to have a conversation about where my life was going. I was feeling stuck at some point, And she said, focus on the core, Simarjeet, and, you know, delegate the periphery items. Focus on the core. Discover your core. Mm -hmm. And um, don't get caught up in the periphery items. Those two inputs really changed my lives, my friends. And to on October 2022, I will complete... 15 years as a professional speaker and coach. I've devoted my life to studying, sharing, and implementing the principles of peak performance and personal productivity, trying to decode the driving force behind individuals who excel, who seem to have a certain superpower that we would all like to acquire. Now, in order to deepen your understanding, our understanding of the subject, uh, and I will be a student here, just like all of you, we have a very special guest today with us, who's a globally sought after speaker, coach, productivity specialist, a certified professional organizer, and who is championing her mantra, which is getting you on the road to productivity, and that is Sandra Lane. Please join me in giving a huge round of applause to Sandra Lane. Woohoo! Sandra, you're welcome. Thank you, Simarjeet. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, thank you so much for sparing your valuable time. Let me also tell our viewers at this point that Sandra's TEDx talk, The Real Cost of Clutter, gathered over half a million views in just under three months. And that just says two things to me, the amount of clutter we have in our lives and how eager we are to get rid of it. She started her career, a little bit more about Sandra before we get to our Q&A. Sandra started her career in sales in New York City and brings a rich and diverse <laughs> 20 plus years of experience in productivity and organization. She founded her company called Organization Lane, and you can see the logo right behind her. There you go, Organization Lane, getting you on the road to productivity. But now she speaks in the corporate boardroom also. Since 2020, her work has evolved, um, but the, the mantra remains the same. The driving force remains the same. She speaks to corporate audiences across the world on the subjects of organization, productivity, and time management, issues for which mm -hmm. you have always left comments on our YouTube videos. I'd like to get more out of my time. I'd like to have a decluttered life. So there, there you go. We have with us a wonderful guest, and we thank her once again for joining us on the show. Thanks again for having me. What a pleasure indeed. Um, Sandra, talk to us about, um, let's begin with the, the tagline right behind you, the organization lane. Right now, I am pretty sure a lot of us who are tuning into this conversation are not on the organization lane. We are on the congested lane. We are on the <laughs> confused lane. We are on what do I do next? Or what do I do with the person behind me lane, you know, because constantly bothering me. We are where the traffic is. Most of us are there. We are where people are stuck, you know, that mental state of being overwhelmed. And your tagline is beautiful, getting you on the road to productivity. Why don't we begin with that? Talk to us about what you do and what's the mission behind this. Please. Sure. So the tagline really originated from the name of my company. My last name is Lane. And 
it was a natural selection for me. It just mm -hmm. seemed like a good fit to call the company organization Lane. And then anything that followed in terms of my tagline, my mission statement revolves around direction and guidance and getting you moving in the right direction that suits you, of course. Mm -hmm. So um, it was just sort of organically morphed itself into this whole concept of GPS and directionality. But it was really, yeah, it just really started at the origins of my business name. Mm -hmm. And then it just kind of grew from there. But it definitely has taken on a life of its own. I love the concept behind it. Sure. And you're doing a great job helping so many people right. get their life on track. You know, some of us are drowning and floating and stuff and still cannot resist the temptation to acquire more. And, you know, but we want to do more. And thanks to, you know, experts like yourself helping us discover what's important and what's not and how to not lead a life of confusion, constant confusion. I'm curious, Sandra, how did you switch from a high flying sales career in New York City to doing what you're doing now. I understand it first started from minimalism and you know not acquiring much stuff and leading that minimalistic lifestyle to now mm -hmm. into personal productivity. Tell, talk to us about the shift. How did, what were sort of the personal influences or any aha moments along the way that led you to what you're doing today? Sure. So uh, as you mentioned, my career began in sales out of college and uh -huh. I always maintained a office in my personal home space, my apartment at one time, and then my home eventually. So I always had to manage mm -hmm. a space and a house. And uh, it was a skill set that I didn't even think was a skill set until I uh, continued to grow into this business. Mm -hmm. And I managed it pretty well. And when I think about the origins of how that began, and I would right. have to credit my parents. Mm. Not the influence of my parents. They were both list makers. Um, they uh, believed in the principles of uh, there's a home for everything and mm. um, keep it in its place. Yep. And I believe that those in those early influences um, changed. You know, they molded me mm -hmm. into the person and the organized mentality that I have. Right. So from sales, I moved into the business of raising my kids. Mm -hmm. I, I left that field and managed my household and my kids, and I spent quite a bit of time volunteering in various organizations, many of which had my kids involved in, band and parents' associations and schools. And mm -hmm. that was a learning ground as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was a lot of management and um, time management involved mm -hmm. when you volunteer for a lot of these organizations. Sure. So that was a, that was a great uh a learning scape for me as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my kids uh, were 14 and 11. And mm -hmm. it was around that time that I found um, I had more time on my mm -hmm. hands and what could I do? What's going to be the next chapter in my journey? Sure. I could really dic I could dictate the narrative for that next chapter. Mm -hmm. What is that mm -hmm. going to be? Right? Mm -hmm. So I thought about my natural tendencies of organization and order. And then I also thought about my business acumen and how could I combine the two? Wow. And that's when I, um, you know, I'm a very faithful person. So mm -hmm. I um, look to God for some prayer and support of family behind mm -hmm. me and mm -hmm. decided to make that shift to start my business of residential and business organizing you know you get in there and you help people remove the clutter that's in their space and help them right. organize what's left and when i was doing that it felt so good it mm. it, it was just it it was uh, amazing how the um the change people yep. went through with mm -hmm. the time that you spent together i never right. could have imagined that it could have been become a business but mm. people um really struggle with this uh -huh. they they are faced with decisions that they just don't know how to handle Absolutely. and um, having a partner mm -hmm. someone working alongside them is all that mm -hmm. they needed to kind of get through it's not the answer for everybody but it it was it, it was an amazing start to this journey sure. while i was organizing i was also speaking on the mm -hmm. side 
Mm-hmm. Um, it was a it was a nice way to get new clients sure. uh, by speaking on the side, yeah. and I enjoyed that as well. Mm-hmm. And then when the pandemic hit, which I know mm-hmm. was difficult for so many people, mm-hmm. it afforded me the opportunity to really reflect on how I was spending my time, and mm-hmm. it made me realize that I was really overworked and mm-hmm. physically drained. Right. As I'm, I'm sure this this resonates with other folks too. During Definitely. that time when we all had to stop, mm-hmm. uh, we, we had the opportunity to really reflect on what we were doing before, mm-hmm. and it gave me the downtime I needed to really think about what is my next chapter going to look like, and mm-hmm. then decide, and then sure. make the changes behind the scenes, which is what I did. So, and this was a hard decision to make because I really enjoyed working hands on with my clients. I but I decided to let it, yeah, it was, it was wonderful. You know, you make these amazing connections mm. and they let you into your life and mm. it's a very intimate part of their life. You know, they're sharing their memories and, you know, things that were very important to them and, you know, you're helping them through a very difficult process. So right. that was hard to say goodbye to and let go of, but in 2020, so I had 10 years of that. And then in 2020 is when I made the shift to speaking exclusively. Oh, wow. And um, yeah, that's a great story. so and and that is it. That's that's its own. That's its own. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, that's its own um, new chapter. As you know, as a speaker yourself, you mm-hmm. know it's kind of um, um, slow to start, but it is picking up, and um, and I've been loving it since I've made that decision to do that. It's a great decision. It's and and it's not. There's more to your story than just uh, helping people get in the organized lane. That you are a living testimony to the fact that you took charge of the direction of your life and steered it into the direction that you wanted it to go, and you made it happen. And not just once, from sales to what you were doing first, and then you realize there's something deeper. There's more to me. How to make use of that? I think a couple of very important mm-hmm. points that I like to dwell on. One is um, for everybody who's listening, you don't need another pandemic to get that time to reflect uh, on your life and where you're going. Uh, travel time does that for me or when I'm traveling or I don't have access to Wi-Fi. It's a great time for me to reflect and see what are the current irritants in my life? What's what's being mm-hmm. a source of irritation? Apart from some of the people that, you know, uh, <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> but what other sort of uh, procedural or uh, lifestyle choices might be the root cause of some of the current problems in my life and how can mm-hmm. I look at them differently and I come back from every trip you know refreshed in the sense that because it, it's it breaks the monotony of the day-to-day work that we might be doing here at the office or in the studio you move away you um, you are removed from those settings and you come back with a fresh perspective and you had that inside during the pandemic. A lot of other people did. They made major changes. But it's important that you need to set up our time to do that periodically, not just wait for another lockdown to happen, God forbid. And um, the second thing that I really liked is you need the attitude of a learner or somebody who's willing to learn. And um, it doesn't matter what you're currently busy with, whether you do, whether it's you're volunteering for a cause, you're on the board of a nonprofit or parent teacher association, as you were saying, it's it's not the thing as much, but your attitude that makes a difference. It's not what you're busy with, but how deeply are you involved? And what's your perspective? Mm-hmm. Are you coming in as a student? And I hope all of you are who, who are t- tuned into this conversation. You've come in as students today. And remember my three mantras for good learning, good state of mind. So take that deep, deep breath in. That's a prerequisite. Before you begin absorbing new information, always deep breath helps. Very nice. Number two, um, take lots of notes, learn with the intention to teach to other people. And number three, participate, stay engaged throughout. So you have the comments box open to type in your major takeaways or your questions. And as well, learn with the intention to teach and apply. You really need one or two, three statements, um, one or two, three insights or aha moments to change your life. And I'm pretty sure that Mm -hmm. will happen somewhere during the course of this conversation today. So thank you, Sandra, for telling us your story, the the backstory of it. And it's not only what you're doing today, but how you got here that has so many lessons for so many people. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, And my next question is going to be about um, what particular tendencies or what particular, apart from to-do lists and being very meticulous at organizing and planning, 
productive people, are they like, mm -hmm. what do they do differently? I mean, are, do they all get up at 4 a.m. in the morning? Are they all uh, vegetarians and ultra marathon runners? Or uh, what have you learned about most productive people? Are they, are they like, a, can, can we, the ordinary mere mortals, can we be super productive? What, what's their secret superpower? What can we learn from them? That everyone has their own formula for mm -hmm. what works for them. Uh, and I think that's important to embrace and mm. to be open, as you mentioned, to try um, something new that perhaps you haven't tried. It may work for you, mm -hmm. but for me, uh, and I talk about this in a book that I'm currently writing, and this is a talk that I do, mm -hmm. one of the very first um, habits that I think establishes the trajectory of your whole day is what happens in the morning. Mm. Those few hours in the morning when you wake up, are so fluid, time goes so quickly. And if you have a wish list of items that you want to complete mm -hmm. in those early morning hours before you sit down at your desk, mm -hmm. how can you increase the chances of success of making mm -hmm. that happen? And I believe that the habit that needs to be established mm -hmm. is preparing as much as you can the night before for your successful morning the next day. So that. what that means is uh, take a few minutes to get the coffee pot ready. And mm -hmm. if you have a timer, make sure the timer is set so you don't have to think about it. You don't have to do it. Mm -hmm. Get your vitamins all parceled out mm -hmm. so you don't have to do it. Mm -hmm. um, get lunches prepared for your kids and put mm -hmm. them in the refrigerator so all you have to do is hand off. Mm -hmm. Choose your clothes that you're going to wear mm -hmm. the night before. Mm -hmm. If you plan on going to uh, you know, work out or go for a run, mm -hmm. check the weather and lay mm -hmm. out your clothes and your sneakers mm -hmm. in your closet so you just quietly get dressed and then go. Mm -hmm. And um, get your kids' backpacks at the door so they just have to grab and go. Right. All of these tasks seem nominal in the morning hours, but they yeah. all take a minute, uh -huh. uh, two minutes, Right. But if you yep. do that all the night before, then you can just focus on the execution of your mm -hmm. morning, mm -hmm. not the preparation. Sure. And I believe that that can really set up the attitude and energy for your entire day just mm -hmm. with that one habit, preparing mm -hmm. the night before. Wow, that's great. And very practical, very pragmatic in the sense that um, it saves you a lot of decision making energy the next morning, right? Don't have to mm -hmm. go through those little decisions, which typically wear us down. And in the process of that, we usually check our phone or some other distraction pops up, and then we forget all about it. And then we go into autopilot. And autopilot is usually one emergency to the next. You know, <laughs> that's typically that's what happens. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. In fact, you know, another one of my, um, this isn't a habit, but it's a tip that I like to share that is a real bonus and can save you a couple of hours a day. Mm. And that is that you don't charge your phone next to your bedside table. Mm. Okay. You charge it away from you right. so that you don't see it. And it's not the first thing that you touch in the morning. And it's right. not the last thing that you touch before you Very go practical. to bed. Very practical. And if you put the yeah, alarm you on, just, you just can't hit snooze, right? Because it's not right next to you. You can't hit snooze. You right. To get out right. of bed. I actually, <laughs> yeah. I actually recommend a traditional alarm clock to wake you up. And right. it, it, it just kind of breaks the tether that mm. we have yeah. for our phones. Let's just mm -hmm. at least disconnect before we go to bed and don't let it be the first thing that you touch in the morning because we've all done it. Mm. We've reached for our phones first thing in the morning and while we may want to innocently check something for five minutes, suddenly it's 45 minutes and our fantastic morning mm. that we had planned is mm. now out the window. And look or at what a, that does. Yeah, it's pretty dangerous. Or it's a nasty it, message it from somebody. Be. Yeah, or uh, maybe the boss early right. in the morning, the night before the boss was up early or the boss was in a different time zone <laughs> and happened to bombard you with a lot of information. And there you go, you wake up and you're walking already when you actually, you should be taking a nice relaxing shower, right? Mm. Right, exactly. Yeah, you want to you wanna dictate the narrative of your day. And uh -huh. if you want to work out, you want to enjoy breakfast and coffee with your kids, and you want to get out the door, not rushed and, you know, chaotic, um, a lot of that really has to happen the night before and mm -hmm. um, not 
touching your phone first thing in the morning also certainly adds to that success. Yeah, no, that that's, that's, makes a lot of sense. That's anticipating mm -hmm. ahead, that's planning, and that's uh, making sure now that you're in the in the lane of, uh, in, in the organization lane, getting on the road to productivity by stepping away from the lane of um, doing things last minute, right? And I've discovered mm -hmm. this when, when I have to travel internationally, say, for example, or some other speaking engagement. If a lot of the important things are not done beforehand, I'm not able to enjoy mm -hmm. the flight or the new location where I'm traveling to or meeting with new people, other things that I should be enjoying because my mind is elsewhere. It's preoccupied with certain other things. So in order for, for me to free up that space, if all the T's are checked and the I's are dotted, and then that means I can now just be in the moment, which means those tasks are off my list. So how does one, I mean, what are your tips on somebody who's maybe been completely driven by day-to-day -day emergencies or, you know, uh, at the moment or demands placed on them by someone else? Um, how does that, how does one move from that situation where they currently have zero control uh, or zero planning over, over their day to a space where they are taking charge and planning ahead? What sort of mindset and tools would you recommend to somebody in that situation? Well, I don't know if I'm the best person to ask this because I'm more of an old school uh, thinker when it comes to productivity tools and mm. pen and paper mm. and a calendar is are, are my tools. Um, yeah, the I know battery that never there dies are... on those ones. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And um, you can shape how that looks mm -hmm. and make it work for you. You don't mm -hmm. have to put yourself into the parameters and boundaries of an app. Sure. Uh, I've just never taken to any apps that are out there. And I know that there are good ones out there that speak to people. So yep. if mm. you have one that you like to use, then by all means, use it. But uh -huh. I'm, I gravitate more towards a, a paper and pen. And I have a schedule that is time blocked, uh -huh. um, you know, a start and an end time to each of my tasks. Right. And I write that up the night before. Uh -huh. And then I use the calendar on my phone. That's as electronic as I get when it yeah. comes to productivity, as I use the calendar on my phone to dictate my appointments. And um, I love using the features of notifying me when something is coming mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. reminders for, you know, recurring events. Mm -hmm. I, I love being able to use that feature because, mm -hmm. you know, you get uh, dental cleanings every six months to a year, mm -hmm. you get mammograms, you have to change your... Um, filter on your mm. home, the mm. air filter in your home, or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, your car needs oil changes and inspections every year. Those recurring events, it's nice to just kind of get it out of your head and let your phone do some of the work for you and notifying you when that event is coming. So mm -hmm. in answer to your questions, it's a calendar right. and it is um, a written to-do list. Mm -hmm. Although when, when I'm time blocking, I, I like to call it a when to-do list. It's not just uh, a to-do list. It's okay. when to do. But, that yeah. makes a lot of sense because then it's not ambiguous anymore and you have more clarity and you are now accountable to that particular time, right? You can't escape it right. unless something's come up. And I definitely agree that's a great starting point, this pen and paper, to-do lists, calendar, because a lot of people get caught up in all the technology, you know, and trying to, all, trying to do it all at the same time. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. And you know what? And um, there's a lot of value in writing down mm -hmm. what you have to do. Um, it helps with retention. As you know, you know, mm -hmm. you like to, you're a teacher. As a speaker, you're a teacher. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of retention that comes from writing it down as opposed to just typing it in. Yep. And there's also a lot of satisfaction when you get to cross it off. Absolutely. Addictive. I love that. Right? Yeah. I, know I don't know it. a digital yeah, so version of it. You. Yeah, it does. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know the digital equivalent of it, you know, uh, which is what I've been. Mean, I physically do. I have to physically check something off the list. It's like use a pen or a highlighter or marker. Mm -hmm. or I even have a, you know, one of these old accounting stamps that said paid. And <laughs> I. I would uh, take pleasure in using, I mean, when I would want, like, visualize, I want to do these 10 videos, and I had them written on mm -hmm. these little cards here, and when the video was shot and recorded and edited, I would stamp paid on it. And just that very act of doing that would give me a lot of satisfaction. I don't think there's a digital equivalent of, of that thing. <laughs> 
Oh, I haven't sweet. found one. I haven't yeah. found one either. And I, like I said, I do find a lot of value in the simplicity of just pen and paper. Mm -hmm. That's great advice there, guys. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. The batteries never die on your pencils and pens and mm -hmm. uh, paper. And you can pull them out anywhere in the flight or even mm -hmm. when takeoff or landing, even when they don't allow electronic gadgets to be used uh, and the uh, the crew is going and giving you that, lick, li that look, sir, please put it on flight mode. Um, well, you're always on flight mode on pen and paper. And sometimes I do come up with some of my best ideas during that time because, you know, that's really mm -hmm. me time undisturbed. There are no other options and uh, you can really think about where your life is going. So thank you for those Keep it simple. I think the message is loud and clear. Mm -hmm. Don't because we get caught up in all this uh, equipment and these technology and these apps. Start with the very simple tools, as you said, to-do lists, the night before, the preparation. Get the decision making out of the way, and um, yeah, and uh, again, keep it simple in terms of not getting involved too, in too much technology. All right, good. That's a great discussion so far. And I'd like to now move on to maybe um, some anecdotes or some funny things or some interesting things that you might have discovered about human behavior while helping your clients declutter their homes and their minds. You don't have to name any one of them, but what, <laughs> what are some of the strange and surprising things about human behavior that you might, might have observed in the 10 years of being a professional organizer and other things that you've been doing? Um, well, I would have to say that uh, th in the organizing industry, we, we that work in this field pride ourselves on not judging our uh -huh. clients. Right. But I am always amazed at how I think our culture today is uh -huh. very, attached to shopping uh, uh, the acquisition of our things mm -hmm. is um a, one of the many sources that creates clutter mm -hmm. and uh it's it's hard to disconnect from that so mm -hmm. that behavior is um alarming to me and i in in the 12 years that i've now been doing this i i don't see it lessening it it mm. seems to be getting worse Mm -hmm. And despite the fact that the messaging of living a minimalistic life and living in moments and experiences, not things, is yeah. out there, it is. certainly more predominantly than it ever has been. But yet, right. um, I think people are still very attached and um, interested in just acquiring things. So yeah. that's that's one thing that I would say that, I, that I've mm -hmm. noticed in terms of behavior that is... Um, that is interesting to me. And then the yep. second is the transformational change mm -hmm. that occurs um, after my client work is, was completed. Right. You know, I, uh, part of this business, it, it really lends itself to before and after pictures. That's you know, right. everybody just loves seeing those before and after pictures. Mm -hmm. But what people don't get to see is what I had the privilege of witnessing, and that is the before and after change that occurs mm -hmm. with the client themselves mm -hmm. from the work that we've done. Uh, it is, it's remarkable. Mm -hmm. And and I know this, not just because of the physicality of, you know, their big smile when they greet mm -hmm. me or, um, you know, just their demeanor just seems to be prouder. They're standing up straighter and taller, but mm -hmm. I've received numerous letters over the years and testimonials regarding the change that occurs from the work that we've done. Mm -hmm. They feel um, that a burden and a weight has been lifted from their shoulders. Mm -hmm. You know, they can think more clearly. There's more clarity and focus and alertness in their life. Mm -hmm. uh, I've even had a client, and I mentioned this in the TED Talk, mm -hmm. about a client who actually lost weight wow. because not only uh, we unearthed the treadmill that was buried with all of her things, right. but she had a renewed interest in running again and wow. using that treadmill. Right. Right. The clutter that was crowding her and filling uh -huh. her surroundings was uh, removing any passion or interest that she had in mm. taking care of herself. Sure. And uh, that's one of many stories in terms wow. of transformational change. So 
I would say that um, that that is probably one of the more fulfilling parts mm. of of learning the human behavior and how it um, how it relates to clutter. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I mean, not only did she end up feeling lighter in terms of how her surroundings were, but also lighter mentally in order to take up something mm -hmm. that was really vital for her running in this case. And she experienced weight, weight loss. That's, that's a remarkable thing because uh, I don't know if it's whether Dr. Wayne Dyer who said this or that your outer life is a reflection of your inner life. So whatever the current reality you're living in is a reflection of what's going on inside your uh, mind are you are you do you believe do you subscribe to that point of view yes yes i do absolutely mm -hmm. i think we have to look within ourselves mm -hmm. and be happy and content much like the quote you shared earlier mm -hmm. um, a lot of our happiness is really within us it, mm -hmm. it's not in the acquisition of the stuff around us mm -hmm. but there are a lot of other issues that are involved yeah. um, in terms of our mindset that can impact our thinking when sure. it comes to our clutter. It's not black and white. It's not that black it's and not. white. I'm not trying to simplify it. Yeah, it's um, not. But, mm -hmm. yeah. I completely but agree. Yes, we had I, a, I do. Yeah. Well, we had a detailed conversation with Joshua Becker as well on this channel um, in exploring. We, we talked about his aha moment when he realized that he was spending a lot of his time just in his garage and just taking care of this extra stuff that he had acquired. And that's probably one of our highest watched conversations so far mm -hmm. in the US for, for the US audience, obviously because people could relate to it. Um, and, um, and as he rightly said, it's not black and white because here's the thing, it gives us you know, to buy maybe gifts or presents for your loved ones. It gives you a lot of mm -hmm. satisfaction or joy. Um, I have my daughters checking my suitcase every time I come back from an international trip, you know, trying to try to check what did I, what did daddy get for us? Or did, you know, and, and it gives me a lot of satisfaction to watch their faces light up with, whether it's a new dress or something. So I think what, what's important entirely is that um, to figure out what's the sweet spot for you, to, to figure out that, mm -hmm. to, to keep it at the level where, it's pleasure, it's adding joy to your life, and it's not become another task, you know, just looking after that extra stuff that you're acquiring. So um, to strike that right balance, that sense of balance mm -hmm. in the long run, for an I person, this is coming from personal experience, if you are not immediately able to control the acquisition or your buying habits or your tendency for impulse buying or shopping, et cetera, Maybe if, if you're not able to get there yet, maybe a good start would be to trying to get rid of the stuff that you're not using. Mm -hmm. That might be a great place to start because as you part with that stuff, gradually the realization might dawn, it might dawn upon you that, oh, in the past, because there was a sale at Brooks Brothers, so I bought four suits which I which don't fit me very well after I realized that when I get them custom tailored, I like the fit so much better. So Moral of the story, if there's a so sale going on, I don't have to buy four. I could, and that's going to come through self-reflection more than anything else. And I think the process mm -hmm. of getting rid of stuff in your in your possession will help that realization kick in further. At least that's been my experience. What are your thoughts on this, Sandra? I absolutely agree, Simarjeet. So um, that's, a, that's a perfect place for people to start. Uh -huh. However, oftentimes, when we have clutter throughout our house, we are yeah. overwhelmed by the mm. idea of tackling it all. Mm. And I uh, like folks to deconstruct the mass of this right. big project uh -huh. down to one step. Okay. So it starts with one drawer, mm. one closet, or one shelf. Wow. And I like that. just work, just mm -hmm. work right there. Mm -hmm. And then pause. See how you feel, okay. and then continue to move on. All right. And each step that you take gets you towards progress. It does. Right. Need. You didn't acquire all of this stuff overnight, so sure. you can't expect to let it go overnight. Yeah. yeah. And a another important tip that I like to share, particularly in terms of the acquisition, you talked mm -hmm. about the Brooks Brothers suit, mm -hmm. is. Once you've gotten to this place where you're happy with your level of minimalism and mm -hmm. comfort that mm -hmm. works for you, and I do believe that everyone has their own level of minimalism. Mm -hmm. There isn't mm -hmm. a, a right or a wrong way. Sure, sure. You, you need to find what works for you. Absolutely. Okay. But it mm -hmm. definitely starts with mm -hmm. owning less. Mm -hmm. 
But in order to maintain that, I strongly recommend that folks follow what's typically known as the one in, one out rule. Mm. And the way it works is, is that if you bring in an item into your home from a category, whether it's been through a purchase or it's been handed down to you or gifted to you, Uh then can you remove an item from the same category? So in the case of your suits, Mm. four suits in, can four suits go out? Oh my God. (laughs) No. The thought of it is a little bit painful, but I've been dwelling on it because every time I put them on, I'm like, okay, maybe it's maybe they're a little too big and I should probably, and that's, this is what I'm planning to do. So, you know, we'll probably auction them off or, you know, uh, somewhere or raise some money for charity. I haven't even worn many of them once. It was just for, you know, you, you go into Vegas and you go to the outlet malls and there's a sale going on and I like this and I like that and let me pick up a few and um, and you end up with things that you're not wearing, right? So, so yeah, that you need right. to take stock of that. Yes, saving money is a huge driver when it comes to making purchases. Mm-hmm. We think we're saving money, but in the end, we're really wasting it because mm. oftentimes it's sitting in our closet yep. still with the tags on. I've seen it so many yep. times, time and time again, and evaluating that purchase before you actually hand over your credit card is mm-hmm. you know, taking the time to really pause and think about, do I really need this? Do mm-hmm. I have something at home yep. that I could use instead? Right. Uh, so, yeah, yeah I think it's important to, to take mind, that Sandra. time. Two very important thoughts come to my mind. You talked about the credit card. See how effortless they're making it now with this NFCs and just tap it or Apple Pay mm-hmm. or whatever. And you mm-hmm. just, the the pain of separation, you know, from physical hard cash is, that, that was, there's been studies around it that you, we actually experience that, that pain in that moment when we are giving out cash versus you hand out your credit card. You don't have to even enter your PIN code anymore, many of these purchases. Just tap right. it. It's processed and off you go until the month later when you get the mm-hmm. statement and then you are evaluating that a lot of your decisions were not. That's that's one thing. I think that the, that ability to pause and so e-commerce here could be a blessing as well. You know, as much as it's a, a temptation, it's a blessing because you could go into the store, see what you like and, ref- and not go for an impulse uh, purchase there. Come back home and, f- and just Think about it. And if you really, really want that mm-hmm. thing, you could order it online from somewhere else. And we really haven't missed mm-hmm. the opportunity. That's one way. Uh, the The second thought that was coming to my mind is, have you observed, and I, I saw uh, Steve Jobs, you know, he would wear this only one turtleneck, mm-hmm. black, black color. I've seen many other people, there is like a fixed wardrobe, right? Uh, mm-hmm. That's what, I, that was the important thing that I was, uh, that I, that skipped my mind. And it's very important here. I think slowly right. with time, all of us, uh, and it worked, it worked for me. I brought my wardrobe to a level where I'm not experimenting wildly anymore with what I wear. Mm -hmm. It's a Mm -hmm. navy blue or a black or a gray, two or three shades. And then I like my shirts custom tailored with, you know, wherever I get them from. Uh, I buy good quality cotton cloth here in India or Dubai or wherever I travel to, I get it stitched. Uh, And I really like the fit of that more than a Hugo Boss or anything else. And now it's sort of settled down. And at 44, Mm -hmm. I have the clarity about my wardrobe, no, better, better late than never, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, which yeah. has now saved me a lot of hassle as far as I go into mm-hmm. stores. New stuff. Ah, that's not me. That's not me. That's not me. That's not me. I know it's a little bit boring, mm-hmm. tad bit predictable. Uh, right. may- maybe this only onset of this happens only at forty-four, but it's helped me a lot in terms of I know this is for me and this isn't. What are your thoughts on that, Sarah? Right. Yeah. So that's a great approach in terms of making decisions of what's in your closet. Oftentimes, clients will have a, a real difficulty letting go of items because uh, they are important to them. Um, yeah, yeah. They like how they look on them. But if uh-huh. you have what what you're describing sounds more like a capsule wardrobe. Yep. So you have several colors that are uh, very narrow in scope. And they all work together. And what Mm -hmm. that does is it makes it so much easier for you to grab items quickly because everything matches. So you don't even have to process what Mm -hmm. will go with what. Every belt, shirt, pants, and jacket that you have blends Uh because they're all neutral colors that work together. Mm -hmm. So so anything else that is not part of that capsule color is going to be easy to let go of. Mm -hmm. 
So that really makes that takes the the um, emotion out of your decision making. If it's not the right color, it has to go. Definitely. And that's actually something I did for myself. Oh, wow. I did this seven years ago. Uh, I came from the East Coast, so black was a big part of my wardrobe. Right. And as I was moving into the speaking space, I really wanted to make sure that I was wearing colors that really brightened me up. Mm -hmm. So I had a color analysis, and I'm so grateful for that. And what they do is they um, lay these uh, color swatches, uh, scarves mm -hmm. on you to mm -hmm. determine which colors are best suited for you. And the color, the color families are grouped by, they call them seasons, summer, okay. winter, fall, and spring. Mm -hmm. And I'm a summer. And there is no black in uh, any of, there's no black. So right. that all had to go. What I'm wearing this morning is a deep uh -huh. navy blue. Oh. So, and it did the same thing for me that your your capsule wardrobe did for you. Yeah, right. It pushed me in the direction of letting go of anything that was not the right color. Wow. And forces me to shop, not because it's on sale, Right. But because it's the right color and the right style the for right what I for currently you. own. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Fantastic. Yes. No, I'm yeah. So, glad so, so that's this... one way to handle it. That's a great way. I'm so glad that mm -hmm. there are options available, like the color analysis you took. Uh, for the rest of us, like, you know, we have to go through a lot of horrible mistakes <laughs> in, in order to get to that realization. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Marjeet, I just want to kind of close the loop on something that um, is important, and I don't Please. want to forget to share this because I think it's very helpful in Please. terms of spending money. Mm -hmm. And that is, uh, I have two tips. Yeah. So uh, the first is to allot yourself cash. Take your credit cards out of your wallet mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and don't leave the house with them if you know you're not going to need them, right? And okay. just spend what is in your wallet. Mm. That stops you from overspending and spending unnecessarily, or yeah, at least yeah. puts a pause on it or a slowdown. If you yeah. really see something you have to have, then you can go mm -hmm. back and get it with your mm -hmm. credit card. Mm -hmm. The second is, you're right, it does make those credit cards make it so easy to mm -hmm. shop. So in terms of online shopping, what mm -hmm. I like to suggest is that you put it in your cart mm -hmm. and you just leave it there overnight. Oh. And the next morning or the next time you open that app that you're shopping on, Amazon or whichever it is, mm -hmm. see if you really, really need to have that. Yeah. It puts a little bit of space between you and the instantaneous click of purchasing an item. Uh-huh. True. And it, True. It allows you to reflect, okay, so I, I put this in my cart. Do I really, really need this now? Yeah. You know what? Mm -hmm. It seemed like a necessity yesterday when I dumped it in my cart, but today, mm -hmm. not so much. Mm-hmm. So that kind of puts the brakes on that spending piece a little very bit. Very helpful. Very helpful in order to take that step yeah. back and not go for that impulse buying. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, great. Thank you for those inputs. Two two things come to my mind. I, one is the um, sunk cost fallacy. Uh, I think um, I read it in this book, uh, The Art of Thinking Clearly. Rolf Dobelli. He talks about the sunk cost fallacy, which is a, happens in the stock mm -hmm. markets, which is a human tendency. If you're losing on a stock, Instead of cutting your losses and selling, right, and walking away from that deal, people invest even more money in, doubling down, going all in, which is you are sticking to the mistake that you made earlier and you want to somehow part of you wants to prove yourself right by putting in more money, believing that you'll recover it all later. And sometimes I think the best thing to do is to accept it as a loss. And this is what they the, the suggest in the stock market too sell it off, take it as a loss and a lesson learned and move on. And I think the same thing we need to do with stuff that we acquired as well. I bought it then, I liked it, it seemed right, but I haven't used it in X number of years. And instead of now spending the rest of my life maintaining and looking after this thing, <laughs> let me give it away, sell it, gift it, do whatever. Uh, th th that was one. And I think the second one was delayed gratification, which I use sometimes. I'm a collector of perfumes. You know, I'm, I'm, I don't hide that fact. I love, I collect perfumes from all across the world and I have a thing for perfumes. So this is what I do. How I manage this little addiction is um, <laughs> set a goal for myself for the entire month or two months or a quarter. You know, I'd like to do myself, I'd like to achieve this, this quarter in terms of, 
personal productivity or other goals or speaking engagements or my writing or the videos or whatever it happens to be. And if all goes as per plan, if it's a three month period, uh, I'll start thinking about which is the next one I want to buy this month, but I'll give it a two or three month window in between because I mm -hmm. know this for a fact. It is the chase. It is the desire before I own it that that matters more than, you know, after I owned it, it goes on the shelf and, you know, it's, it's a fancy new fragrance for the next two weeks. And then the quest for the next one begins, but to manipulate that desire cycle into pushing myself to higher levels of accountability and productivity. So I reward myself with that little thing and I've sort of managed it to a level where it's reasonable, where it's not, um, addictive but it's also contributing positively to my lifestyle. So I don't know, it's working for me. Have you had other people? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I love how aware you are of your addiction, <laughs> first of all, yes, yes, and yes, how, yes. You've, how you've in a very creative and clever way managed yep. to manipulate it to get you to work. Yep. So I think that's, that's terrific, and that works for you. And uh, one thing I'd like to highlight is the fact that you're working in these three-month chunks, right? I love being able to mm -hmm. recommend to folks to set goals in in those small blocks. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier mm -hmm. to work towards something in that 12-week period mm -hmm. versus 52 weeks in a whole year, as we tend to do with New mm -hmm. Year's resolutions. So mm -hmm. I want to highlight that because I think that's that's wonderful. And then the second thing, getting back to your sunk cost fallacy, is I talk about that, but I, I frame it a little bit differently mm -hmm. in uh, the world of clutter, and I call it value mindset. Okay. But the but the theory is the same. Mm -hmm. We have invested maybe a couple hundred dollars in a pair of shoes that hurt your feet, or right. a Vitamix that's broken. It's mm -hmm. broken and mm -hmm. maybe can't even be fixed. Mm -hmm. But we have to it because in our minds it's mm. valuable it's mm -hmm. an investment right and therefore we just can't give it away right. we can't throw it, throw it away or pass mm -hmm. it on mm -hmm. because that's money in mm -hmm. our minds it equates to mm -hmm. money that we're letting go out the door mm -hmm. and that doesn't seem like a very wise decision to make so sure. we hang on to it yeah. And what we're really doing there is just creating more work for us in terms of maintaining all these things that we're Absolutely. not using or wearing. Mm -hmm. No, very valid points there. And I think, uh, folks, if, if you've been listening so far, uh, listening carefully, I think a lot of tips there, a lot of uh, personal anecdotes uh, about how to go about decluttering your life. Sandra, at some stage you mentioned where, when you were talking about the lady who happened to lose weight in, terms, in the process of um, uh, decluttering her home. Um, wh what do you think some of the mental clutter might be? Are there any limiting beliefs that might promote this sort of behavior? Do you uh, address that area or, and you know, how should people go about doing the inner work of decluttering mm -hmm. before, before they undertake the outer work? Right. Okay. So when I think of metal clutter, I think of something else, but I think I know what you're talking about. You're talking mm -hmm. about our mindset around clutter, our attachment, you know, right. um, to it. And, and how do you kind of work around that? So we can, if there aren't any diagnosed um, issues uh, that require the work of a therapist yeah. uh, with a client, yeah, it's certainly something we talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, the The most work I've ever done with a client really revolves around sharing experiences that mm -hmm. are attached to the item that they need to make a decision about. Sometimes sure. they just that's therapy in and of itself. Yeah, just sharing the memory that comes with this particular item okay. or the story behind why they have this many coffee mugs. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then we talk about solutions. You know, it's a very slow methodical process mm -hmm. that needs to work for them. So they don't have regrets later when it comes to opening that cabinet and not seeing it there anymore. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they'll call me up and say, you know what, this is not working for me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it's a very slow process and, uh, you know, it does kind of border therapy. I'm not a licensed therapist in that way, but right. um, just being able to share the meaning uh -huh. behind their attachment to some of these items 
that they want to let go of but just don't know how to is um, a great start. Oh, definitely, the, the self-awareness around it and perhaps that will lead to questioning. Um, I think that mm -hmm. the automatic next step that happens at some stages, oh, really, that, that's why I'm holding on to this? Um, and then mm -hmm. you see the either the, excuse me, you see either the point of it or the, uh, the sheer lack of any common sense behind mm -hmm. it, and then you, you arrive to a more productive uh, decision. I know time is of the essence here. We, this has been a wonderful conversation, 50 minutes into it, but you know I'm loving it so far. It's flowing so naturally, so much value to add, Sandra. Thank you so much. I'm going to come to, uh, towards the end, one of the biggest challenges in, in retaining productivity or having a productive day is um, dealing with distractions. Um, so, oh. th yeah. <laughs> we could talk fifty minutes about I know, distractions. I know. <laughs> what, what, what would your I know, um, and that would be a distraction uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. for the for the agenda for a talk. But if you were to pick your top one or two tips to deal with distractions mm -hmm. in a digital age, especially mm -hmm. for youngsters, um, or you know, for all of us, so, I mean, let's not make it age specific. But um, what would your top two or three tips be on how to deal with distractions when you you had a great start to the morning? You've done your to do list. You've visualized. You see yourself achieving it. It's all in order. And then I don't know. Uh, Simarjeet Singh starts a live stream on um, mm -hmm. uh, LinkedIn, and then you spend one hour listening to the interesting conversation Singh and Sandra Lane were having, and then you realize you're behind on your stuff. And what do you do in that scenario? <laughs> Okay, so the first thing is uh, you have to change the notification settings. So um, I'm assuming that we're talking about our phones, yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the notification settings are very simple. Yeah. You put it on do not disturb. Right. That is, that's a start. And I'm not suggesting that you have it mm -hmm. on do not disturb all day. Because Absolutely. that would be completely unreasonable. Yeah, they'll but miss out on important stuff like our live streams, right? Understood. Yeah. Uh, absolutely understood. Mm -hmm. But can you put it on do not disturb for 30, 60 mm -hmm. minutes? Mm -hmm. That's all. And then sure. allow yourself that time to do yeah. deep work mm -hmm. and get into a rhythm and flow of working. And then you can take a break and pause. And I do encourage people to use a timer in order to manage that. And you can even see that timer, which is right here on my wow. desk. Wow. This is this is what I use. I, yeah. I practice this myself. You set nice. the timer mm -hmm. and you can actually see how much time you have left, which mm -hmm. kind of keeps you focused. And mm -hmm. then you can see how much more time you have to wait before you have to touch and pick up your phone. So wow. notification settings is is huge and working against the clock. I, I, mm -hmm. I like that tip that kind of work in conjunction with each other. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is, um, and this may not necessarily speak to everyone, but it was mm -hmm. revealing for me, and that's why I want to share it, is to become aware of exactly how much time you're spending on your phone. Mm -hmm. It is shocking. Mm -hmm. It's shocking. Yeah. So I would encourage you to first sit down because you'll be shocked, mm -hmm. open up your settings, and then go to screen activity right. and see how much time you're spending there. Right. And then also it gives you a breakdown of where you're spending your time. Mm -hmm. So which apps are drawing your attention? Mm -hmm. Which apps are the problem? Yep. And can you remove those apps from your phone? Make them less accessible? Mm -hmm. That's a solution right there. Make them less accessible. It's yep. so easy. You're not mm -hmm. deleting your account when you right. do this. Yep. You're just making them less accessible. Mm -hmm. So those would be two two tips that I would share. I could go on and on. Like I no, said, I do a whole talk tips. on just this. <laughs> <laughs> those are great trips, uh, tips and very practical because I like the, the the fact that you can implement them right now. But guys, do not disable yes. my, my notifications. Don't do that. Don't disable mm -hmm. notifications from my channel. Or <laughs> never, <laughs> never. never. I mean, right. I'm sorry. The caveat there is anything else except... Right. 
this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're joking there, but thank you. I mean, that, that's, that's really, that makes a lot of sense. And I like the part about deep work. I love it. And I think more than mm -hmm. me, it's my team. Are you listening, guys? You, you guys need a timer, not knock on my door when I'm in the middle of coming up with the next important <laughs> <laughs> thought. But I think it all comes down to, um, yeah, stealing that little time away from all of this chaos mm -hmm. and, you know, that little right. corner wherever it happens to be, however it happens to be, whatever works the best for you, early morning, late at night, whatever suited to, I mean, you know, I've heard this um, thing about, you know, the 5 a.m. club, I think Robin Sherman's written a book on it, and there's there's been a whole lot of talk about it. I admire it, I love it, but for sometimes I feel if God wanted me to see the sunrise, um, he would have made it at 11, that would be very, very convenient, right, for someone <laughs> like me. And for my biorhythm, it, it's, it's, it works okay, you know, but uh, not that I have a major difference, Difficulty when I have an early morning flight to catch. I'm pretty flexible like that. But overall, I think um, we need to sit down with ourselves. And that's the essence of what I'm getting from what you've shared today is that find out what works best for you, experiment, fail, try again, and then you'll come up with your own little toolkit. Um, and the broad guidelines remain the same. Some of you that you've freely shared, very, very useful. Parting words of wisdom for our listeners on how they can stay in the organization lane? <laughs> um, I would say to reflect on your quote earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that quote is a wonderful one to start this whole conversation, and that is to really look within yourself mm -hmm. and be content there because mm -hmm. that is really all you need in the end. Mm. It's not our things. It's right. being content with ourselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, you know, the um, ancient uh, Sufi philosopher uh, Bulle Shah was asked some, by someone uh, who was, um, he just had uh, very little belongings, just a piece, a piece of cloth on his back. And somebody asked him, how are you so happy despite all these challenges that you have in the material world? And he, something, he said something very, very philosophical. I recorded that in Urdu and Punjabi as well on my channel for those of you um, you know, understand those languages. We'll share a link in the description. But the essence of all that, of what he said was gratitude. Gratitude uh, in the end. Um, you, we have, mm -hmm. we here in order for us to have this conversation and for you, if you are tuning in, you already are and probably, if not the 1%, at least the two or three top 3% 3 on this planet. Because guess what? More than 60% live on less than $2 a day or something like that. And so if you're tuning in, if you have electricity, Wi-Fi, a gadget to listen to, uh, to listen to this conversation, you're already in a select group of people. Mm -hmm. So your challenge is not that you don't have enough. The challenge is we have more than enough. That is our challenge. Think, the, think about the irony of that, of modern existence. Mm -hmm. Our challenge is not that we don't have food and water and other necessities, that we have the excess of those. We're dealing with the side mm -hmm. effects of the excess of those. So it's self-regulation and gratitude in the end. Um, I believe it comes down to that. Sandra, thank you so very much. From the bottom of my heart, you were very flexible. Um, thank you, you. You said yes, and we loved your TED Talk. <laughs> we'll share the link to Sandra's TED Talk um, as well. Guys, towards the end in the description, check out her courses and her website and other material available online, as well as her social media handles. And before we uh, say goodbye to all of you, we do want to know from you in the comment section what your top three or top two takeaways are from this conversation here today. And with that, we say goodbye to our wonderful guest today. Sandra, thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. So ladies and gentlemen, that was Sandra Lynn with her suggestions on how to lead a productive life by decluttering and by organizing yourself. And she shared some very valuable and practical tips that I think we can all apply. I just want to share with you something from personal experience, um, which is um, I usually designate an entire month for organizing at the office. So October for us, because October starts with a no, is organized October. So what we do, here's what we do in October. We call it the organize, the month of organizing. And we follow Sandra's principle, which is one drawer at a time, one shelf at a time, 
uh, one binder at a time, one folder. Uh, so it's not just organizing the physical space, but it's also organizing the data. It's also organizing, streamlining our operations, also getting rid of a lot of stuff from the office. Uh, right now, it's just implemented for our little team here, and, and it's um, for the office only. If time permits, I may apply it to my residence also, but I think it helps if you devote a chunk of time specifically maybe a week or two weeks to organizing and getting rid of stuff. Really, really helpful because then you know and people around you know that you work as a team together, maybe one hour a day for the next one week or next two weeks, you have to declutter and organize because as Sandra rightly said, these are tough decisions and since you've spent a lot of time acquiring or saving all this material, you won't be able to get rid of it immediately. So you need, uh, you need time and space to reflect and streamline this operation and you also need help. So make sure you share it with other important people around you that you are on this pursuit of getting rid of extra stuff in your workspace, in your surroundings and streamlining and organizing the space. So for those of you who have enjoyed this conversation today and have not watched Joshua Becker's um, conversation interview with me on the subject of minimalism, we'll share that in the end screen with you here. And as I already said, all of um, the links to Sandra's online work, her TEDx talk, her website, social media handles, etc. You'll find them in the description below. And keep in touch and stay tuned for our next conversation. And do not by any means switch off your notifications for our particular channel. For everything else, you can switch off the notifications, but not for the Beginner's Mind series. <laughs> Take care, guys. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.